life is full of changes. It really is all about change. No matter how comfortable you are right now in whatever circumstance or situation that you find yourself in, change is inevitable to come into your life. And the older I get, the more I recognize and realize that I don't really like change all that much. Quite frankly, most people that I meet that go through changes often do not like the changes they are going through. Change can be hard for all of us. Uh, several years ago, I had to actually switch the brand of dress shirt that I wore that I'd been wearing for years because they changed the cut of the dress shirt. All of a sudden, they went to this trim, slim fit cut in their dress shirt, didn't make the classic fit anymore, and all of a sudden, I couldn't wear them anymore. As you can tell, I am not a trim fit dress shirt wearing type of guy. Change, it was hard. I had to find a new shirt. I know that's third world problems here. But I also am reminded several years ago, Chick-fil-A messed with their barbecue sauce. There was an uproar for those who love the classic Chick-fil-A barbecue sauce. And they went to this smokehouse barbecue sauce that just wasn't any good. I, along with thousands of other people, raised complaints. Bring back the old recipe of your barbecue sauce. Thankfully, the good folks at Chick-fil-A listened to all of us barbecue sauce lovers, and they switched back to the old recipe. But boy, I'll tell you, when they changed it, it was difficult to navigate the barbecue sauce change. Change is inevitable in our lives. And tonight, I want to talk to you about a guy who began preaching in Luke chapter 3. A very familiar voice in the Scripture that brought a message of change. It was a different sermon. It was a different message. It was pointing to a different person. The people had never heard about it before, and he brought some change with him. But since that message began, I want to tell you, there's not been any change since he started preaching it. And you know, it really goes back to the Christmas story. We just got through the Christmas season. In fact, in my neighborhood, I think the final uh, garlands and reeds and outdoor lights were taken down this week finally. But when we get to the Christmas season, I love beginning in Luke chapter 1 because we're really introduced to two moms. We're introduced to Mary, who was pregnant with the Lord Jesus, and her cousin Elizabeth, who was pregnant with a man we would know as John the Baptist. And John the Baptist came on the scene and he preached a different kind of message. He brought some real change. And he started preaching a message that has never gone out of style since he began preaching it. John the Baptist was born to the priest Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, born just six months before Jesus. And he would be a preacher that would point the way to the Messiah and the beginning of the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus. And one of the more familiar statements that we attribute to John the Baptist was what he said that we read in John chapter 1 and verse 29. And the next day, the scripture says, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John was a passionate preacher and he preached a different message. He preached a message of repentance and baptism. He was a fiery preacher, and he was pointing the way to the Lord Jesus Christ. Some have referred to John the Baptist as the wild man in the wilderness. And in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 4, Matthew writes and tells us that John wore camel hair and a leather girdle, and he ate a diet of locust and wild honey. I think it's safe to say that John the Baptist was not dressed in the most hip or trending fashion of the day. He didn't wine and dine with the elite and the popular, the world's brightest and best. But what he did have was what was promised to his father Zechariah by the angel Gabriel in Luke chapter 1 and verse 15. The angel speaking to Zechariah says this, For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. You see, in a culture we live, there's a lot of talk 
about drawing a crowd. But the reality of John's ministry is this. He was filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And when the Holy Spirit is on the loose, he draws people to himself, even in the wilderness where John would preach. And while many things come and go, and while changes are inevitable in all of our lives, it is good to be reminded tonight that some things never change. Some things never change. I want us to go to Luke chapter 3, and we're going to look at two verses tonight and then kind of be around these verses the rest of the message. But we want to start in verse 15 and 16, and we read this. Now, as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered saying to all, I am indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John is preaching a bold message in the wilderness. John is preaching a message pointing to Jesus. People were saying, are you the Christ, John? No, no, no. One's coming mightier than I. But he had a powerful message. And I want us to draw just three simple truths from this thought that some things never change and draw from the message that John was preaching. And first tonight I want us to see this. Jesus is the message. Jesus is the message. The centrality of John's preaching was Jesus Christ. We just read it a moment ago. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of of the world. We just read it in verse number 16 of Luke chapter 3. One mightier than I is coming. I am not worthy to loosen his sandal strap. You see, the focus of John's preaching was Jesus Christ. Repentance and turning to Jesus. Putting our faith and repentance of heart and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. In verses 7 through 9 of Luke chapter 3, we read and dig a little more into the details of John's message that he was preaching there in the wilderness. Verse number 7, we read this, Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, listen to this, Brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now John the Baptist probably didn't win any awards of winning friends and influencing people. I mean, can you imagine being under the preaching of John the Baptist and him starting to preach by calling and calling everybody to attention by the title, Brood of Vipers. That'll get your attention pretty quick, won't it? But he did have the right point, and that was a message focused on repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And John pointed out, in the beginning of his message that he's preaching here in verses 7 through 9, John pointed out that everyone needed Jesus. And it's a truth that never changes. We're talking about things that never change. And something that never changes is everybody needs a relationship with Jesus Christ. Every single person. It does not matter. John was talking in this saying, it does not matter that you're a descendant of Abraham if you do not have the faith of Abraham, and that is an individual choice of repentance and faith in Christ and Christ alone. He's preaching to a group uh, of Jewish people who felt that they had a relationship with God simply based on the fact that they were descendants of Abraham. And because Abraham had a blessing and a promise of God that they got in on this gospel. They got in on salvation simply because of who they were, simply because they were descendants of Abraham. And John is saying that's not near enough. Just because you are descendants of Abraham doesn't make you followers of Jesus because you need to repent and put your faith in Christ alone. 
And, you know, John was addressing something that many people struggle with today. You see, our faith can't be something that we view as passed from generation to generation. Now, all of us are influenced by our parents, influenced by our grandparents. I'm so grateful for grandparents who follow Jesus, parents who follow Jesus. And certainly I have been blessed by watching their example. But I am not saved and I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ because my parents did or because my grandparents did. I have a personal relationship with Jesus because I made a personal choice to repent of my sin, put my faith in the person of Jesus Christ, His finished work on the cross, His glorious resurrection, believing what He said in His Word, I have placed my faith solely in Him. It is my faith, not my parents' faith, not my friends' faith, not anybody who's taught me. It is my faith. And you see, salvation isn't passed down just because you're a a, a part of a good family. Just because your parents were good church-going people. It has no bearing on you or your spiritual condition. You see, the question that John raised is the same being raised tonight thousands of years later, and that is this, what will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? You see, Jesus is the message. Jesus is the centrality of John's preaching, but the reason that he is the centrality of John's preaching is because Jesus is should be the centrality of all of our lives. Because without Him, we simply have nothing. We have no hope. We have no everlasting life. We have no abundance of life here. You see, Jesus is everything. There are a lot of good people being distracted by a lot of so-called good messages. Our culture is full of it. There's a lot of messages that are encased with good-sounding words like love prosperity, acceptance, and tolerance. But these messages are lacking the most important word, and that is the name of Jesus. And any message on good-sounding words void of the person of Jesus Christ is a deceptive and false gospel. But it isn't even the word Jesus anymore in our culture today. You have to ask the question now, what Jesus? Because so many people have hijacked the word Jesus to fit into the mold of pop psychology and leftist wokeism. They have hijacked the word Jesus to fit whatever uh, whatever, uh, idea or thought that they have at the time. Or the word Jesus to back the lifestyle that they want to choose to live. But my friend tonight, we know according to God's word, Jesus is the virgin-born Son of God. Fully God and fully man. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born to the Virgin Mary. He lived a sinless life. He performed mighty miracles. He died a sacrificial death. He was buried and rose in victorious resurrection. He was seen by many witnesses and 40 days later ascended back to the Father with this great commission that He gave us, command us to go into all of the world, teaching the Bible and baptizing believers. Angels appeared to the sky and to those disciples, giving them the command that this same Jesus would come again and receive us to himself. My friend, according to scripture, that is the real Jesus. And that was the Jesus John was warning the people that was coming. This is the the message that John was preaching. Jesus is the message. He's the message that we continue to preach today. And whatever feel-good pep talks are happening, if the message and the person of Jesus that is being described does not line up with who we are introduced to in Holy Scripture, that, my friends, is a false gospel, a false Jesus. You see, we we understand who Jesus is based on Holy Scripture. Any, Any form of Jesus that we are introduced to that contradicts the truths of God's Word, that's not the real thing. We have to line up the teachings and and the philosophies with God's Holy Word. We are introduced and we know Him by Scripture. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8 reminds us that Jesus Christ, I love this, He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
He doesn't change. His message doesn't change. His character doesn't change. His miracle working power doesn't change. His attributes hasn't changed. His power hasn't changed. His glory hasn't changed. His, uh, his, his uh, Godhead hasn't changed. He has not changed. His character hasn't changed. His, uh, his, his opinions about life and marriage and gender and creation, none of those things have changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus does not change. But oh, I'm so glad that the Jesus we read about that has saving power, He's still in the saving business. He is still the same Jesus. Jesus is the message. Some things never change. But second tonight, I want us to look at this. Some things never change. And, and, and number two is this. Repentance requires change. Repentance requires change. So John in his preaching is introducing us to Jesus. John in his preaching and in his teaching to those gathered in the wilderness is keeping Jesus the focus of their attention. But he is preaching a gospel of repentance. A gospel of repentance. And you know, that's the same thing that we need today, and that is repentance. We must come to the Lord Jesus in repentance. And you see, repentance isn't just a mere, I'm sorry. You see, I'm sorry is a great phrase. But the change of behavior following I'm sorry, that is the essence of true repentance. It is, Lord, I am sorry, help me to change. Lord, I am sorry, but I'm going to change my behavior. I'm going to change my actions with your help. So John the Baptist's sermon here in Luke chapter 3 took on a very practical approach. I want you to notice what he says in verses 10 through 14. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? And he answered and said to them, He who has two tunics... Let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. So here John is. He's preaching this fiery sermon. He is preaching and introducing people to Jesus. He is talking about repentance and baptism. And crowds are gathering and they begin to ask him questions. Well, what does this mean? What shall I do now? If I repent, what does this mean for me? And John got very practical. You see, when we accept Christ as our Savior, when we repent and turn from our sin, there is a change that Jesus brings on the inside of our lives. We can no longer say we belong to Jesus and at the same time live the old way of life. That just doesn't happen. When the Spirit of God comes to live and take residence on the inside of our heart, it is followed by Glorious change. Now, we know that sometimes change is slow. It doesn't mean that overnight you become a sanctified and, and, and just perfect person. That doesn't mean that. We are daily being sanctified. We are daily becoming more like Jesus. So it, uh, it, it's a process of becoming more like Jesus. But the point is this. We have a new desire. We have a new hunger for God. We have a new outlook on life. We have, new, uh, we have a new guide. We have a new compass for our life. Old things uh, are passed away and become, behold, all things become new. So when we belong to Jesus, when we get saved, things start to change. Uh, when the Spirit of God takes residence in our lives, change takes place. And that's what John is talking about here in a very practical way. Repentance requires change. So he mentions to those who have two tunics, give one to those who, who, who don't have any. For those of you who have a lot of food, 
Give to those who are hungry. The tax collectors say, well, what about us? Take no more than what is required by law. Don't skim off the top. Don't take a portion for yourself. Be honest in your business dealings. Soldiers say, what should we do? Don't intimidate people. Deal, uh, deal kindly with people. Uh, be content in your wages. And so he becomes very practical. We could boil that down. John is teaching them, you need to serve others. You need to serve others. If God's blessed you, bless others. If God has given to you, pour out blessing on others. Serve someone else. Meet a need. Be a blessing. Be honest. Tax collectors were notorious for being deceitful people. And he's telling them, we need to be honest in our business dealings with others. We need to love others. Don't intimidate other people, but love them. Show the love of Christ. Learn to be content. All of these things are changes that repentance brings about. Fruits of the Spirit, a new way of life, a new way of living life, a new way of serving other people. You see, the Jesus life is a life focused on others. The Jesus life is a life focused on being a blessing and meeting needs and sharing the light of the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it seems easy enough, doesn't it? But if you've been a believer long enough, you know the battle that all of us have. It is difficult to do this. It seems easy enough, but living out our faith can be difficult at times, and here's the reason why. It's not because we don't love Jesus. It's not because we don't want to go to heaven. It's not because Jesus, we, we, we're, we're ungrateful for His blessings. How good has God been to us? No, it's simply this. We still have a thing called the flesh. And the flesh is a constant battle for every believer. And it is going to be a constant battle until the Lord calls us home and we receive our glorified body. We fight the flesh. It's the flesh that draws us into those old ways of living, those old ways of thinking, those old habits that we try to break. It's the flesh that, that we simply have to crucify every day when we take up our cross and follow Jesus. The flesh. We constantly battle the flesh. The flesh is the things that brood uh, pride. It broods being dishonest. It broods protecting ourselves. It, it broods selfish thinking. It, 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 it broods all of this stuff up in our lives. And we have to fight against it. Because when we are repenting and we're staying clean before the Lord, we have to follow and walk according to the Spirit, according to God's will for our lives. It is a constant battle back and forth. It is the tug of war between what we know to do and what we want to do, but what our flesh is pulling us to do. It's a war. And Paul writes about this in Galatians chapter 5, verses 24 through 26, where he says, And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit... Let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another or envying one another. Crucify our flesh. It is a daily battle. It's a daily struggle. It is a daily decision of crucifying the flesh, being surrendered to the will of God, and wanting to do the things that God is calling and inviting us to do. Repentance requires change. How many times have I looked at my children who have done something that they shouldn't do and quickly say, I'm sorry. Why? Because they don't want to be punished. They don't want to have something taken away from them. They don't want me to be mad at them. They, don't, they want to go back to the way it was before they did what they shouldn't have done. But you see, repentance is, is just like when, when one of my kids do something wrong. Daddy, I'm sorry. Those are sweet words to hear. But then I see them change their behavior. I see them do something different. I see them make the change. And all of a sudden, you're forgiven. Dad loves you. Thank you for doing that. You see, it's not the words that we need to say as much as the actions that we need to take. All of this is very hard to do. It sounds very simple. It's hard to do because of the flesh that we just talked about battling with. But God's grace is sufficient. 
God's grace is sufficient. So as we think about some things that never change, Jesus is the message. Jesus is the message. He's still the message today. We must come to faith in Christ. We must repent of our sin and turn from those things that are sin and take us away from God's will and way for our lives. But thirdly tonight, I want you to see this. Some things that never change. Opposition follows obedience. Opposition follows obedience. Here in Luke chapter 3, John is in the wilderness. Out there in his camel hair, eating the locust and the wild honey, preaching this gospel of repentance and baptism, pointing people to Jesus, sharing the message He is coming, one greater than I is coming, the true Messiah is coming, Jesus is His name. But He didn't get there by accident. He got there because He chose to obey God's will and assignment for John's life. And we read about it in Luke chapter 3, verses 2 through 6. And here's what, the, what, what Luke writes. While Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. I want you to notice what he said uh, in verse 2. The word of God came to John in the wilderness, and in verse 3, he went into all the region around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. The word of God came to him in the wilderness. He obeyed and began preaching in the region. John obeyed. The word of the Lord came to him and he went and did what God asked him to do. He started preaching. And we don't know that John had any kind of marketing campaign. We don't know how the word got out, but what we do know from the accounts of Scripture is people made their way to the wilderness and they began to hear John preach and they began to repent and they were being baptized. You see, it is a reminder we don't have to be slick when it's Spirit-filled. The word of God came to John and John obeyed and he went and started doing what God had called him to do. Obedience is such an important part of the spiritual journey. It is such an important part of our walk with the Lord. It is one thing to be saved. It is one thing to be repentant. But we, can't, we, we cannot be in right relationship with God living in disobedience. When God asks us to do something, the only response for the believer is yes and amen obeying God, obeying God. So we don't know how the message spread. We just know people started coming. And it wasn't too long before there were hundreds of people coming to hear the message preached by John and their lives were being changed. But no matter how good the message was, no matter how many great things were happening, it didn't take long before the word got out and there became opposition right around the corner. And in Luke chapter 3, in verses 18 through 20, we read this. And with many other exhortations, he, being John, preached to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. And for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this above all, that he shut John up in prison. You see, John was so bold in his preaching. John was so bold in his messaging the 
coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, this gospel of repentance and baptism, He was calling out sin. He was calling out even the leaders of the day. Herod the Tetrarch, who was uh, in an improper relationship with Herodias, his brother's wife. And John called him out. And John's fate was set when he started preaching against the leader, the political leader of the day. Herod made up in his mind that he was going to shut John up in prison. You see, when God calls us to obey, when God calls us to obey, and we follow in obedience to what the Lord is asking us to do, let it be known there will be opposition to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. There will be opposition. John preached. John was obeying God. John was faithful to do what God had called him to do there in that wilderness and all around the region of the Jordan River there. He was preaching. He was doing what God had called him to do. And the moment that he offended Herod in his sin, Herod made up in his mind, I'm going to lock him up in prison. And eventually... John's life would be taken from him where he would be, headed, be beheaded by Herod. All these years later, dear one, when you obey God, watch the opposition come. God does a great work. Don't you ever think that there's not going to be something to come in and wrinkle up the status quo. How many times have I walked away from this pulpit, walked away from a worship service, walked away from an event, walked away from an opportunity where God just moved, where there was a spirit of worship, where God did something great, where someone was saved, where somebody's life was changed, only to be met with opposition right around the corner. I can't tell you how many flat tires, floods, sicknesses, dead appliances, expenses, car trouble, loved ones die, disease, diagnosis, opposition opposition to the Lord's work you obey God and start walking with him and start doing it in boldness friend do not be surprised when opposition comes it's coming I never will forget it 2010 we had just come back from a great mission trip in Gainesville Florida with our youth choir uh, and that week, the Lord had moved. We had done backyard Bible clubs. We had, we had worked in different ministry organizations. We had sung at a revival service every night. I think there was close to 60 people, men, women, boys, girls, who had placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Students were leading others to Christ. It was a wonderful week to see God's work in that community. We came back here over the weekend, Sunday night, right here in this auditorium, had a homecoming concert. We had our youth choir up here, and we shared about all that had taken place and what all God had done. We heard testimonies of God's faithfulness. I was on cloud nine. I was thanking God. I was rejoicing. I was on the mountaintop. Look at what the Lord had done. We were just weeks away from welcoming, Chelsea and I welcoming our first uh, daughter, Mackenzie, into this world. We pull in on a Wednesday night, and water is just flooding out our garage door. I'm thinking, the, what in the world happened? A water main had broken in our kitchen, flooded our hole downstairs. Coming out uh, of the garage, everything was ruined, furniture. and well, I mean, it was a mess. Just weeks before, we would bring our first little baby home. We went to immediate construction uh, project to get it all cleaned up and insurance and adjusters and all of the mess. You've been there so many times as well. You know what I'm talking about. You say, was that a fluke? Was that just a coincidence? Was that just, uh, that, that just so, just happened by, by, by mistake? Opposition. Opposition to God's work. Opposition. Because you know why? The devil wants us to quit. The devil wants us to sit down. The devil wants us to disobey. The devil wants us to uh, run in fear. But I'm encouraged by what the psalmist says in Psalm 42, 11. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise Him, the help of my countenance and my God. 
Job, who had lost it all. He says in Job 13 and verse 15, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. Though he slay me, I'm still going to trust him. I'm still going to praise him. You see, obedience is followed so many times by opposition. Satan wants you to throw in the towel, believer. Satan wants you to quit. These are not new tactics. He's not just lobbing these fiery darts at you to pick on you. This is something that has never changed. The enemy has been doing this to believers for all of time. Why? He wants you to quit. He wants you to throw in the towel because, let me tell you something, the world is watching us. The world is watching us. We must stand for the Lord in these days. We must stand behind what we say we believe in. We must stand on the authority of God's Word. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and His righteousness. On Christ the solid rock I stand. Satan wants to make you doubt that. Satan wants you to throw in the towel and quit. Keep serving Him. Keep obeying Him. Keep shining the light of Jesus wherever He has called you to shine and serve Him. Keep praying. Keep trusting. Keep serving. Keep worshiping Him. Keep praising Him. Keep on with Him. Stay with Jesus. It is worth it. You see, Jesus is the message. Repentance, it requires change on our part. Opposition, it follows obedience. These things never change. Jesus never changes. Be encouraged and stay with Him. Stay in tune with the Lord. It was just a few weeks ago, on a rare Saturday morning, we had at home. It was a lazy Saturday. We had no appointments, nowhere to go, no shopping to be done, praise the Lord. No groceries to buy, no rehearsals or recitals or events, just a rare, quiet Saturday morning at home. I decided I would fix breakfast for the family. And I fr started frying up some bacon, making the eggs. We had a great morning together. It was beautiful outside. It was a little cool, but not cold. And I just lifted the windows in the kitchen. Let a little bit of the bacon smell out of the house, but little cool, fresh breeze come through the house. I took a plate down to my mom and dad downstairs. And as I was coming back up the top of the steps... I was met by a smell that was so familiar. And instantly, instantly, I went to my Nana's house, my grandmother, my mom's mom. I had so many fond memories of spending the night with her, so many Friday nights, waking up on Saturday morning. And she would open her back door. She had a screen there, and she would open that back door and let the cool breeze blow through her kitchen. And she would begin frying bacon. And I would wake up, the, the smell of the bacon and that cool, fresh morning breeze blowing through. It was just such sweet memories. I remember just getting to the top of those stairs and that smell, that aroma that just instantly took me back to my grandmother's kitchen. And I said, thank you, Lord, for those great memories. Thank you for that wonderful feeling. I just stopped and said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for Nana. Thank you, Lord, for those moments that I had growing up with her. It was a tender and sweet moment. I'm sure there are moments in your life where you smell something cooking or you are in, uh, in somewhere special, a, a special place, a special moment that automatically your mind just goes back to special memories and moments. And I thought, you know what? The smell of bacon frying, 
the cool morning breeze never changes. Smells the same all these years later. Some things never change. You know, the longer I live, and I pray this encourages you tonight, we see the world we live in, so many things going wrong, so many things up and down. The world is in chaos and turmoil. Sometimes it's so hard just to, feels like we can't even keep our head above the water. Trials and struggles, sickness, death, disease, it surrounds us. But oh dear one tonight, I want to remind you, there's some things that never change. You can obey God. He's going to be with you. With God's grace, you can change and embrace this new life that He's given you through Jesus. Most importantly, Jesus never changes. He is the message. He is our hope. He is the reason that we live. He is our strength. He is our song. He is our everything. Jesus is enough. When Jesus is all you have, let me tell you, He's all that we need. He is everything. And in a world that is rapidly changing, every single day, be encouraged by some things that never change. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the ministry and the preaching of John the Baptist that pointed us to Jesus, that taught us repentance, that lived out in front of us a life of obedience, no matter prison or what befell him, he was faithful to proclaim the message that you gave him. I pray you would encourage all of our hearts, no matter what we're going through, no matter what situation or storm, wherever we find ourselves this moment in time, oh God, we pray, encourage us Remind us that you are faithful and that you never, ever change. Great is your faithfulness, O God. How we love you and how we thank you. Meet the needs of your people watching. Encourage them. Be with them. Strengthen them. Watch over them. And Lord, we pray all of these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.